Time now for the GCN Tech Clinic, where we aim to answer your bike tech and maintenance related questions. As ever, you can submit your questions down in the comment section below, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible within the allotted time. Alex, go. First question is from Jeremy Milo9378. How often do I need to service cup and cone bearings that are ridden on the road in exclusively dry conditions? Hubs are Shimano 600 Ultegras, ride 250 kilometers a week. Thanks for the details, but um, it's kind of going to vary. Cup and cone bearings um, typically can last a long time between service intervals, but it's mostly down to how well the hubs are sealed to not only keep the grease in, but also keep the dirt out. Now in the past, I've had some wheels which use cup and cone bearings which have lasted absolutely ages. And I've also had some which have basically needed to be serviced every six months, kind of like without fail. So the answer is very much it depends, but if you are riding exclusively in dry conditions, I think you're gonna not need to worry for at least an annual service. Although one stipulation on that is, you know, with our recent trip that I had with uh, Hank over into Arizona, the dry conditions there have actually taken a greater toll when I've inspected my bearings and stuff afterwards than I thought. And, oh. and it's, it's basically, it's so dusty there. That's a good point, yeah. So there's all this very fine dust in the desert that gets in and just eats stuff. Um, um, that's a really good point. So I guess the takeaway thing is like monitor it regularly. If the second you feel that they're a little bit rough or noisy, you need to service those ASAP yeah. to look after those hubs. Uh, next question is from DJM Sydney, who says, on March the 11th, I will attempt the Falls Creek Peak Challenge in Australia. It's 235 kilometers, four and a half thousand meters climbing. Oh, fair one. Sounds awful. Um, and his estimated time will currently be around 12 hours. I currently ride a 28 millimeter tubeless setup on Pirelli Chinterratos. Will swapping out to Pirelli P0s or Pirelli uh, P04 Seasons improve my finish time? And if so, by how much? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I think if you went from the, so currently the Chinterato is one of the more sort of slower, more robust tires that Pirelli have. We're talking about Pirelli because that's your example. P0 is the fastest and the four season P0 sort of sits in the middle. Slowest to fastest, you're talking the huge dis difference, like minutes, handfuls of minutes. Um, of course, you need to take into account the slight reduction of puncture protection and stuff like that. If you do puncture, you're giving away any of the time that you've saved. Um, but in my experience, I would go with the P0 lightest, fastest tire and accept it's going to be faster and make your life easier. And you're also massively reducing your puncture risk by running tubeless. Yeah. So I've been using in English lanes, like just the P0s, not the P04 seasons um, for my rides in winter right now and set up tubeless. I've not had a puncture yet. Touch wood, you cursed um, it now. But I, I ride a lot of miles <laughs> and I've not, I've ridden through a lot of disgusting, dirty roads with loads of detritus on them. I've not yeah. had a puncture, so they're pretty good. Also, when I did the um, Tour de Station last summer, thousand kilometers in the mountains, I thought, asked myself a similar question to what you're doing, and I opted for the uh, P0 SL. And I actually asked Pirelli, and they said, run the P0 SL. Um, the slight weight saving over Chinterato, the puncture protection when run tubeless is still pretty good. And the rolling resistance gain is massive to the point where you're gonna be minutes faster. Yeah. Like, you know, and then, yeah. Just... If you're interested in speed, go for that option, basically. Yeah. Um, right, next question. You'd actually skip past this one. I'll go back, don't panic. Carlos P. Parada, they say, hi, GCM people. Lately, I'm having cleat position problems with my right foot, but not the left one. The cleats on both shoes are in the same position. Any ideas as to why this could happen? Yes. Don't trust the markers on the bottom of your shoes for starters. They're not always the same left to right or different shoes. <clears throat> and it could also just be that you need to have a different cleat position for different feet because of how your body is, like how your position on the bike or just natural imbalances with your body. So you yeah. don't always have to have left and right the same. I would suggest one of the easy ways to try and fix this is to have a cleat and pedal system which allows for additional float and movement in your foot because then it can almost like self-select its place a little bit. But if you are really struggling to get this right and your, like, your problem, like your pain in your knee or whatever is persisting, you're gonna need to see like a bike fit expert to get that like assessed correctly. Yeah, it's normal for people. People aren't symmetrical, yeah. basically. 
Um, next question is from Gunther Kainers Dorfer. Okay. Who says, hey folks, love your British humor. My bike shop mechanic said, I should not worry about maintaining the press fit bottom bracket on my six year old BMC road machine. Actually, I don't have the special tools to open it. They said, as long as I do not have any obvious issues, I should not touch it or replace it, especially because newer BBs often tend to wear out much faster. Um, they say that quality was actually better in the old days. What do you recommend? Cheers, Gunther. I'm in agreement with the mechanic that you've spoken to. If it works perfectly fine, leave it be, and um, as it sort of wears out, then look to replace it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, like sealed bottom brackets are sealed. Yeah, <laughs> they and, don't and, need to be. And that's the thing. Yeah, with with like the press fit sort of bearings and stuff, they are designed as a consumable part. They're not designed as a part that you reinvigorate, re <clears throat> replenish, or whatever word yeah. you want to use. Um, yeah, when Simple. it's dead, change it. Um, X, what's next? Hey, Alex and Peter. <laughs> Someone got your name wrong for once. Um, I've got the 105 DO2 with 50 34 chain rings and an 11 to 34 cassette. Can I slam an old Tegra or X brand um, 52 chain ring on my bike and not have to change anything else? Well, you can fit a 52 tooth chain ring on your bike, but you are going to need a slightly longer chain. Mm. And going with a 52 larger outer ring, really, you need to increase the size of the inner chain ring because the jumps between the two isn't going to be optimal. I have run it. Before as 52-34 yeah. uh, experiment, I think the first time I did like an Everesting, I, I tried that because I wanted a bigger gear for the descent. Yeah, um, and it does work, but you do have to really like be careful with your change because you it's much easier to drop the chain. Yeah, and you know you don't want to do that. Um, so yeah, I'd, yeah, get a 36 tooth, uh, th the full chain set. Yeah, got a next question. Um, crap maggot. <laughs> okay. Yeah, all right. Says, answer this one. Okay. Yeah, please. Um, I've always carried a tube for emergencies with my tubeless setup. I recently switched from 700 to 650B wheels and I'm running a balloon-esque 47 millimeter whoppers. What would happen to a standard butyl 700C in a tube rated to 28 millimeters if I stick that in a tire and inflate to one and a half bar? Do I need to carry around enormous 650B specific tubes? It barely fits in my pocket. Um, thanks and good night. Well, I have a feeling that a standard road inner tube might inflate and stretch to fit that size up, but it's mm. going to be very stretched and therefore not very resistant to punctures and there's a chance it could just puncture as it like pops and tries to fill the inside of the tire up. I do have a sensible solution here because realistically you need to carry in a tube that is designed to fit the wheel size and the tire width that you're using, yep. right? This is one of the advantages of TPU inner tubes because they fold up way more compact yeah. and even ones which are designed for super wide, big chunky boy tires still go pretty small. Yeah, and you you know, they are expensive, but you in, term, in terms of like pounds per watt performance, they're really good. Yeah. Like the rolling resistance is really good. They're lighter. And um, something that a lot of people don't realize, you can repair them. You can patch them. Yeah. They do special kits for it. Good so, advice, that. Yeah. Right, on to our last question is from Hunt Shoot Off Road. How come every aero versus climbing bike test is conducted as a time trial when 95% of the bikes are probably ridden in a bunch? Um, where are the aero versus climbing bunch test videos? what would the watt savings be on a climbing bike within a bunch um, like versus like a five minute out of the front effort on an hour ride? Yeah, yeah. it's a good question. I mean, the, the most obvious thing is like whenever you perform any kind of experiment, the way in which you do that is you always try and eliminate as many variables as possible. Yeah. And so you try and control for as much as you can. So having just one rider is an, a, a better way to conduct a test. Yeah. What invariably happens though, whenever you conduct any experiment in any field of science, is that you answer something, but that invariably leads to a million more questions. I think that is kind of like the, the next follow on question. And I, I really do like this question and it's something I would like to investigate further. I yeah. think it's probably something we should look to try and do in the future. Yeah, it would be cool to do in a video. I think one of the other things that is a misconception, and you see this constantly when you talk about oh, you should ride an aero bike in the Tour de France or whatever. Yeah. And people always go, yeah, but like 95% of the race is spent in the peloton, so aero doesn't matter. 
that's that's a, that is a complete fallacy. <laughs> Aero still matters even when you're in a bunch. Um, you well, know, yeah. you are going to save more energy riding in the drops in the peloton than you are riding on the hoods upright in the peloton. And overall, the amount of kilojoules that you have to burn throughout the throughout every day, cumulative over three weeks, adds up. I'm, I'm totally with you on that, but I think I would like to investigate and see how much impact it has, because I think it might surprise a lot of us. Mm. Yeah, all right, right, that was the last question for this week. As always, let us know in the comments section down below if you've got a question you'd like to answer, and we'll get there in the coming weeks. Love you, bye. See you later.